Yeah, man. We're back in Kalelus. You know, this great source by Cyclone Covey is one of those things that you could go over and over and over again. Because ain't nobody checking for it, you know what I'm saying? Like, because ain't nobody checking for, you know, the info that, that you know what I'm saying, the drop, you know what I mean, that we are building on, like, they're, they're watching, you know what I'm saying? And some of them are, you know, jumping on it. You see it. I mean, y'all see it, you know what I'm saying? You see we the wave, my nigga, you know? That's because you the wave, man. And we, you know, we always been the wave. That's the thing about it. You sparking up over here, man. And you ain't new here, man. We always been walking in that truth, my nigga, you know, with that true cross, my nigga, with that towel, with that covenant. This is who you are. Kaleluz means promised land. And they still can't figure out what language the word Kaleluz, you know, is stemming from or coming from. It's not connected to none of their language families that they could connect it to, which to me is just a, um, it's a breadcrumb. It's a breadcrumb, man, to come on home, man. <laughs> but we know we're talking Cali. We know we're talking Khalifa. We know we're talking America. And we know we're talking Kalelu. We're talking promised land. So by now you can dodge your own hijacks, you know. I'm gonna, you know, just read it as it is and you know, we'll discuss it as we go like we always do, man. We're gonna pick it up in uh oh, oh yeah, we're gonna jump right in, my now. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 105. Let's get to 105, man. <laughs> Lego, man. I hope you have an Azani, you know, on top of the soul, man. You know, that you stay on top, man. You know, this is the Naga powering up. It's a little shaky. It's a little bumpy. I know sometimes, you know, psychologically, you know what I mean? It gets real, you know, fuzzy and confusing sometimes. You know, don't be too head heavy, man. Too many mind, man. I love where we're at right now, you know what I'm saying? Because we're at a place where we're not really applying too many mind, you know? It's all vibration. It's all that wave, you know what I'm saying? We, we got the fire to spark up all these different ways. But we're practicing, you know, control, you know what I'm saying, um, for ourselves, you know, within ourselves. When, when you can control yourself, then you're the master. Then you can pop off with extreme power against that hijack when, when you got to, you know what I'm saying? But right now, the first step to driving up is controlling yourself, controlling your emotions, controlling your feelings, you know what I'm saying? Controlling your intentions. What is your intention behind tribing up? Is it just to have buddies, people to talk to, people to text all day, people to be on the phone with all day because you're lonely? Is your intention just not to be lonely? Maybe, you know, your intention is to try to stay ahead of things. You know, maybe you just want the information. Maybe you just, you know, just constantly, you know what I'm saying, need that, you know, next, you know, uh, mind blasting you know, piece of drop to come out, man. But it's not about that, man. Driving up ain't about that. It's about the vibration. And there's only one way to conquer that vibration within yourself to get that control is to keep the cold. So we got reoriented over here in Drive Nation. You know, just look at our journey. Look at all the drop. Look at the formula that's been given to us by Hawa to keep talking about our indigenous truth, to keep you know, tuning up in our frequency and knowing how important words are and frequency is. That 432. And I get, you know, to keep us in cold, man, to keep the script, you know, opening up for us, man, being clear, clarified. Of course, to know our orientation and we are firm, fixed, and immovable has been our formula from the very Get go. As soon as we came out the gate, as soon as we were shot out by a wise, strong, the strongest archer, as this crystallized arrow, we've become has dropped nation. The mixed multitude, the Abyssinians, but not, you know what I'm saying? And now we're learning, man, more than ever, 
how to orient ourselves, how to orient all that indigenous truth, you know, how to orient our frequency, our nine spiral, how to get oriented even with our, you know, orientation itself. All within the code, how to orient all that within Hawa's code, man, to make keeping the code a thing, a thing, you know what I mean? We're making it a thing to do, not something to read, but a thing, you know, something that's popping. We're trending right now, my naga. Hey, a word to my nagas. KTC, man, keeping the code is trending right now. It's the hottest topic. And the dopest thing is that the topic ain't what's the code. The topic is, wow, man, they popping off, man. That feels good. That's when you went, you know, from your mind bone and you're just spiraling up in that heart bone. As so I said, you know, I'm going to write it on their heart, man. I'm going to write this code on their heart, man. And now the tribe is feeling it more than just saying, oh, OK, read it right here. Exodus 20. No power for your power. No vanity with Hawa's name. No, no uh, skipping out on your time of rest of, of your Shabbat together. You know, they get to that. But first they get that frequency. They get that. Whoa. My knock is popping off with that. Whoa. Right now. Naga, we are the hottest trending topic in Nagaville, man. And Nagaville connects to the land beyond the pole, my Naga. You the hottest, man. You the greatest. You the greatest. I'm proud to be with you, man. I'm proud to be a code keeper by your side, man. And we gonna hold it down, man. We the press the we the function. We gonna hold it down, man. You know what I'm saying? And we're gonna spark it up because what we're doing, in terms of any recent history, we can confirm <laughs> has not been done by any, you know, Negro Naga community. Keeping the code, keeping Shabbat together, outside of, you know, the the cliques and the and the, you know, uh, you know, camps, you know, sprouting up here and there. It's like as far as just your regular Naga that's getting this drop right now, that's listening in the back of the class, my Naga, you're a part of something unprecedented, man, that a group of Nagas started popping off, spiraling out that heart bone, that Ruach, waking up out that Ruach Tardy Ma, popping off, man, creating a music genre, tribe of music, man, inspired by Five Eyes Ma. Nagas keeping the code as the trending topic. This just in, random Nagas are keeping the code everywhere across the earth plane. Yeah, that's the trending topic right now, Naga. That's you. Everyone's having this code conversation in their household. It's like, you know, this is making sense. Don't kill each other. Don't, don't steal from each other. I like that type of community. We didn't got to know each other. Maybe, you know, I know it's hard to trust each other right now. We got a lot of scammers. We got a lot of, you know, people that scamming on the frequency, right? A lot of people fronting out there. They ain't really keeping it cold. They ain't really tribing up, man. Again, tribing up don't mean you got a group of people. Look, look, we got we got land too. We tribing up, <laughs> but y'all ain't keeping it cold. And you ain't tribed up yet within yourself, within your own heart. You know what I'm saying? To check your emotions and your intentions. What did you want, man? What do you want from us? The only thing you should want for us is that we keep the code. Outside of that, my Naga, you should just be so grateful and humble to know Nagas that's keeping the code. Keeping their Shabbat, they resting, man. Spiraling up, man. Sundown to sundown, my Naga. The sun exhausts its energy. He pops back off, my Naga. You see it. You see the sun come and go. You ain't moving. The sun's making a circuit. He giving you that Baruch. After all that energy is exhausted, that's the end of your day. And a new day begins, my night. A new cycle. You keeping the code, the covenant. They be trying to get you out your towel for a long time. And these towels, these crosses are popping up right here in Tucson. Arizona, New Mexico, 
all the land of the Naga, Hawaku. Who is Preston John? Hey, allow a for the code keepers. The water for your support in all your ways, man. Getting that mem sauce flowing for our bro yourself, man. And, you know, allowing us to put a bag in the hand of our aqua, Miss D. You know what I'm saying? And just keep it flowing for the next house, for the next Nagas. You know what I mean? That, you know, have genuine, you know, situations going on, man. And you're supporting that, man, with your, you know, donations and just your love, your contributions. And the water for what you're doing for our family, man. We truly appreciate you. Dragons on the wall, all the sponsors at 432, we appreciate you. We can break bread because of you. Allow wa. On page 105, this is under Fowler's Qualms and Hawley's Antidote. Let's go. Miss Miss Ostrander read her paper suggesting a connection between the arrival of the Roman Jews in Arizona <laughs> and the arrival of the Toltecs in Mexico. This same February, as Sarley's paper at Phoenix, their conclusion would have been better headed had Fowler not, meanwhile, grown doubtful of the Latin inscriptions he had been the first to translate. A New York Times article. Listen up, because they acting like they ain't never heard of this stuff today. But we got the evidence in these great publications like this one by Cyclone Covey that everybody knew about these Roman, <laughs> right? Roman Jewish artifacts. We got that the Romans are the Remon, are the Remani, are the pomegranate, Granada, Nagas popping off like a grenade. <laughs> Like that fire right here in America. So you are the Ramon, the Roman is the pomegranate. They stole the title Roman or Roman. <laughs> so they're calling it Roman Jews. We're talking Ramon Hebrews. Remani Hebrews. That's all we're saying. Remani pomegranate promised land. Kalelus Hebrews is a Remani. Kalelus Naga is a Remani. That's it. That's all. <laughs> After that, it's stolen titles and it's hijacked city. We come back to the root around here. They don't take our, they, they took the title so, you know, they can't take it no more. You know what I'm saying? Once we prove that they've stolen our titles, you can't have it back, man. Get my ball back. Get my grandfather's wallet. We the Remani. We the Remani. We the Remani. We Kalelus. Who else talking about Kalelus? Because it's not for them to talk about. No, quote, Native American is bringing up Kalelus or the Chickamauga. Until we start talking about it, then they say, oh, well, that's, that's our heritage. Really? How about the Almec? Is that you too? Nah, these Nagas got a different frequency. You don't touch those mounds. <laughs> you don't go too deep looking for Montezuma's treasure because you know that's a different breed of Naga you're talking about with a different frequency that can tap into that. Can't front on the frequency. Let go. So check it, a New York Times article of December 16th. They dated 19, 1925. Okay, December 16, 1925. Had noticed his finding quotations. Had noticed his finding quotations in them from Horace, Cicero, and Virgil. Model type phrases and groups of words thrown together in alphabetical order, yet with little or no connection. An Associated Press release from New York on the 14th had quoted the eminent Columbia University political historian James T. Shotwell, who pontificated that A.D. dating did not come into general use 
until about <laughs> 1000 AD. Whoa, that's all right. Slow down. Slow down, slow down. <laughs> so this Columbia University eminent political historian, James T. Shotwell, is saying that y'all didn't even start dating anything A.D. until about 1000 A.D. <laughs> My naga, we got to slow this down, man. We, we've been talking about Anatoly for the man And why we keep talking about for the man is that the more we dig, the more it lines up with what Anatoly for the man is breaking down. The Russian chronographer who's breaking down true history and timelines based on mathematics. And he's saying all this stuff was duplicated and spread out. And when you put it back on top of each other, the history is not that deep. It, it doesn't go back that far. So they had to they had to create and Managa, they created antiquity. They gave us these dates. They gave us a lot of fake ass artifacts, Managa. They created history, right? Right? We've been saying you know this, right? You would say it without even knowing anything. You would say, I know these hijacks probably created history, like they just made stuff up. Here's your proof. Chronology. The proof, Managi, is that they didn't even start dating anything A.D., which you think means after Christ or something, right? <laughs> or after death, what? After Christ's death? But that wasn't until a thousand. Now, you know, you know they added at least a thousand years by now. You know they added a thousand years to all native people on all native lands by now. You know they added, they added this time so that they can now have a thousand year gap to play with, right? So they can take history from the 1700s and push it back to the 700s. So even when we're reading this uh, 775 Nehemiah, Theodorus, and Sylvanus, Texas, Solomon, the Builder, Sylvanus, Bravo, Ogam, Swanite, you know, Con, Connection, even when we're connecting that, in 775, like the Templar say all the time, man, you got to put a one back on that. <laughs> that could easily be popping off in 1700s. And how would you know? Show me your drop of the true history of the 1700s. And I'm going to show you the Chickamauga, my not. And what does the Chickamauga, what she Chickamauga have to do with the she and the Almec? And what does the Almec have to do with Sylvanus? Ogam and Bravo and the Swan Knights and the Barbers and the and the uh you know and the Templar Monaco. How's it got to do with the secrets? How's it got to do with Atlantis sinking and you know this great flood of eight ninety nine or something like that? You know that's really popping off probably recently more more recently than that. You could research the California flood in the eighteen hundreds. We just born right. We just born into this matrix right. <laughs> and we're already in the program of it, of their version of antiquity where X marks their spot, not our spot, their spot, right? If I say, come, come kick it at my spot, you'd be like, oh, shit, I'm about to chill at Drops Crib, man. We about to just have some great food. It's about to pop off. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be great conversation. Oh, man. Are we, are we going to drop spot, right? X marks the spot. Now, if the hijacks say, come to my spot, Shit, you might be in that courthouse or, you know, you might be in the jail. <laughs> That's they spot, man, right? So <laughs> those are two different spots. When we talk about Europe, man, you're talking about a fested environment. You know, I mean, just research what Europe was like, you know, in the 1500s and 1600s and 14. Like you're talking about just bodies in the street, plague, disease. We didn't know none of that. We were in extraordinary good, extraordinary great health. You know, that's what we got in the Americana Holocaust, right? So, make sure you're tuning in, man. I'm back on on these shows. We're getting them out. Everything's, you know, just caught up like we needed to be. And we're about to be on the website real good and start getting things beautiful and just uh, lots of new looks on the website for you. And, you know, you've been patient, my naga, and, you know, we got it. Again, we ain't got to rush it. When we got it, we got it, my nigga. We got X marking the spot. There's two different spots, right? 
All right. So when the hijack's talking about, you know, uh, this point in history, they're trying to put you in a different spot. When the hijack's telling you to observe their holidays and their crap, they're trying to put you in a different spot. <laughs> now, what has their spot led to for you? Captivity. You've been vanquished, subdued, captured, you know, all that stuff. You know where that spot leaves. Dead or in jail. Dead or in jail. Dead or in jail. Now, where's your spot, man? So your spot, man, is these mythical. Whenever it Whenever the hijack talk about you, it becomes mythical real quick, right? Now we're just in mythology. Your spot is paradise, crystal trees, avatar flow. You know what I'm saying? Those are two different locations on the all is happening wave. Hey, it's all happening. When you keep the code, it's all happening for good. When you keep, when you don't observe, it ain't like, well, the creator's just being mean. Nah, the creator's telling you that you got to surf the wave. That he gave you a wave. Amma Amma gave you a wave. Abba gave you a wave. Just like you give a wave to your children. You say, hey, you do this. We straight. Clean up after yourselves. You know, don't use that language. You know, da 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 da. We good. Show respect. I'm going to give you ultimate Aha. You disrespect. Now you chose a different. You chose an interference pattern. And I know how to interfere, my knock. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, hey, the hijack know how to interfere too. All these demons and devils, we call them, they are there for the interference pattern. This uh, Satan, the devil, and all these other names is only there for the interference pattern. But at the end of the day, he serves the wave. He plays his part. In code, those energies can't fade you. They got no dominion. You talking about you talk about um, you know what I'm saying what's the dominion of this corporation and all this judicial you know uh, you know longitude latitude of dominion it's all about dominion man you don't give the hijack no dominion Sylvanus told Texas is telling you man in that in that Nakamade you know what I'm saying you gotta keep them robbers out your gates man you can't let your your thoughts it all begins with a thought. You can't give that thought dominion to lead to an action, you know, that you wish you could take back. Like it started with your thoughts, man. If you let if you let them thoughts simmer around, it's gonna turn into action. So as soon as you got a thought that's covetous, or you got a thought that's bearing false witness, or you got a thought, you know what I mean, that's thinking about murder <laughs> or, you know, stealing, you know, all that stuff, or putting a power before your power, you you meditating on these hijacks too much, like you got to get them robbers out your gates so that you can end up in a better spot. So when it comes to our spot, you got these cats like uh, John T. Shotwell from Columbia University who's letting you know that they didn't start using A.D. until 1000 A.D. So what were they calling it 100 years before that? There ain't no A.D., my noggin. There ain't no B.C., my noggin. Shit, really, there ain't no time. It's only the way. And you got checkpoints. Again, like a dancer that's spinning without getting dizzy. You know, she got to, you know, get that uh, that point, a focal point, right? So once that dancer can have a focal point every time she's doing them spins, Michael Jackson does a spin, he, he needs to have a focal point or else he's out of control. You got to have a focal point, which is the code, which is your Shabbat. Every week, you got a focal point. That's all we're talking about. So you can hit a different mark. So it's all happening. Ain't no time, but the focal point, you know what I'm saying? Your checkpoint is your checkpoint. And Anatoly Fermenko said, man, they pushed your checkpoints back 333 years first shift. All right. So they'll take something from the 1800s and push it back to like the 1500s. You know what I mean? And then the second shift is a thousand, uh, was it 54 years? So they'll take something from the 1800s and push it back a thousand years. So it got dropped off 333 years in the past. And then it got dropped off a thousand years in the past. And then you go back to that same event from the 1800s and they're going to push it back now. 1700 and 78 years was the third 
major chronological time shift. So they took that event from the 1800s, and now that shit's popping off in like 45 AD, right? So you got this history about the, you know, so-called uh, Christ, right? And and uh, these saints that's popping off right around 30 AD, 40 AD, 50 AD. Managa, that's another major chronological time shift, man, according to the mathematics, the astronomy, everything that's leading up to showing where the phantoms and the, duplica the duplications in the timeline are happening at, man. I, I advise everybody to dig on that parallel timelines in history. Dig on that, um, uh, you know, Anatoly Fermenko recon. He got volumes after volumes after volumes of recon, man. Just get lost in it, belly flop, and just, you know, see if you can put your story together because at the end of the day, they can only do so much. And notice it's happening in Russia, right? So a lot of this Russian drop, man, you know, is the keys, you know what I'm saying? Again, think about the Byzantium Empire, you know, right around these these areas, Russia, Turkey, all that stuff, you know, being a big focal point for our people over there. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I believe it's all about the vortexes, these dragon lines, these ley lines, and guarding certain areas of them. You know what I'm saying? Like the Amazon High Queens, right? All right, so let's go. There ain't no AD <laughs> until 1000 AD. So the Toussaint Citizen or the uh, publication called The Citizen, had a double encouragement from New York to rival the star with the headline, quote, relic text are cribbed from dictionary glossary. E.S. Blair, a Tucson attorney, had formerly practiced in New York City, which wrote the article, which asserted that Gaul and Sinai, S-E-I-N-E, were modern French words, that the artifact Latin was classical, not 8th century. It tried to be classical, but a close look reveals more 8th century construction. That Hebrew was neither known nor studied by Christians in 8th century Europe. So they're confused because they're trying to put these artifacts to the 8th century. But he's saying it couldn't have came from Europe <laughs> because Hebrew wasn't even discovered there until around that time. Hmm. Right. But are they even uh, are they even going to walk that path of saying that these artifacts are from here because this is the old world? Or are they going to keep trying to make this the new world and push things over there into the real new world? <laughs> and, uh, you know what I'm saying? Suddenly, they have issues. You know, you know what I mean? Like, now they're running into these glitches. You know what I'm saying? Because they say, well, Hebrew wasn't even, what's it say? But a close look reveals more 8th century construction. Hebrew was neither known nor studied by Christians in the 8th century Europe. It wasn't known. So it's not even like they started. It says he there was not. Hebrew was neither known nor studied. In the 8th century Europe. So in the 700s. Remember those. Those whatever they are. They converted to Judaism. <laughs> under King Bulan in there. All right, so they converted under King Bulan in there, man. So that was what? The same thing, 800s, you know, uh, 8th century, 9th century. They just converted then. But it, they don't have no actual connection, you know what I'm saying, to Hebrew or Israelite, anything. They were just converting at that time. So you got to put it together, like, you know, if you just, uh, if you just converting in the 8th century, 9th century, you can't be these OG Hebrews if you're just becoming converts. You, you're just becoming converts to some of the ways, some of the teachings, right, that have been twisted by this Judaism at this time. You know, they're just getting uh, <laughs> acquainted with us. And they haven't even started studying Hebrew in the 8th century in Europe. This is how recent all this stuff is. But now they act like they're masters at this stuff and they, 
we need to learn from them. But they're finding the Hebrew, you know, alphabet, a left bet. They're finding the entire a left bet, my nigga. They're finding, you know, of course, the Los Lunes Decalogue. They're finding the code, right? They're finding the commandments in Picto Paleo Hebrew in a huge stone in New Mexico. They're dating back, what, 1,500 years, something crazy, 2,000 years? <laughs> thousands of years, right? So if this stone goes back thousands of years, and they weren't even, again, Hebrew was neither known nor studied by Christians in 8th century Europe. So they didn't even know about Hebrew as a language at all. They didn't study it. And they were just converting to a branch of twisted Hebrewism called Judaism or Judaism, the ism of Judah, right? But they have a stone with your commandments on them. You know, the. <laughs> Right, your so-called Ten Commandments on them in Paleo Hebrew that they date back thousands of years. So where's the old world? Where's the biblical history taking place? Where's Joshua, you know, fighting these Canaanites in there? You know, we beg to insert uh, our theory <laughs> that clearly it's all happening here. And these deserts you see today weren't deserts at some point. You know, they were you know, flowing, you know, lakes and oceans and rivers. And, you know, it was different, man, without all these damn dams, right? These damn dams. Let's keep going. Hebrew was neither known nor studied by Christians in the 8th century Europe and that the epitography, epigraphy indicated probable copying from recorded history like many hasty students of the problem since Blair assumed the crosses with Latin to represent Christians. <laughs> so why do they keep calling it a Roman Jewish da 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 da, right? As soon as I say cross, you think Christianity, right? Because that's how the Tao has now been, you know, skewed. His points and Shotwell's pronouncement sounded much more telling in the 1920s then in the 1970s, it is the headline about the glossary cribbing that made that still presents the same magnitude of difficulty. Even the star conceded to Fowler, March 7, 1926, three Latin text, three Latin textbooks contain all phrases on artifacts. Three Latin textbooks contain all phrases on artifacts. Fowler had specified two Latin grammars, Harkness and Allen and Greenbows together with Roof's standard dictionary of facts. Also, the star quoted Cummings as saying a Mormon might have buried the tablets to bolster the Book of Mormon. <laughs> you know, same thing they say to us when we are finding these you know, indigenous, you know, Hebrew tribal names, you know, and all these places throughout Utah. Oh, Joseph Smith named all that. <laughs> Why can't you accept that he found it? Because, you know, that's not the popular narrative. The popular narrative is that, yeah, he renamed all this stuff just to do this and that. And therefore, what? Just for his Mormon community? And, and, and that's as far as it goes? And then it lines back up with your public school education that everything's over there on the other side of the map and that you're in the uh, West. Not that the map is flipped upside down and you're really in the East. When you factor all this in, you're in the Far East. You're in the Orient that they've been talking about. You're in the Greater Asia. You know what I mean? We're talking about the Third India, the Greater Superior uh, India, my noggin. With the land of Preston John and Khalifa, you know what I'm saying? So hard to believe that Joseph Smith uh, really just pushed up on an area he knew was Judea. 
to set up shop. Let's go. Miss Ostrander wanted to know where Harkness, Allen, and Greenbow found their Latin phrases. They all, they as well as the artifacts, inscription used only classical Latin and established existence in the 8th century and none later. The inscriptions Latin was less correct, obviously learning on some kind of pedagogical, pedagogical collection. Miss Ostrander thought such in, inadequacies and errors, or we might say today, it's non-classical caste confirmation of authority or authenticity. It's non-classical caste confirmation of authenticity. It proved harder at the time for even sophisticated observers to appreciate her argument. They assumed that writing errors portrayed, betrayed a bad hoaxer. How a hoaxer who wrote such inept yet sometimes complex Latin as we incidentally would expect of a time when Charlemagne himself could think maturely but not right at all could have remained so meticulously faithful to 8th century calligraphy, word division, temper, etc. was a question which not did not loom as large in the 1920s as now. Fowler's and Cummings' conclusion that the inscriptions told no story and recorded nothing had not held up as very finely discriminating either. They, they validly asked the question, how would a hoaxer in the 19th or 20th century have contrived these inscriptions without going on to ask, what would an 8th or 9th century chronicler in Arizona have said in the indicated circumstances if he did happen to be there a hoax does not solve the mystery but substitutes another of perhaps even greater insurmountable insurmountability it remains today harder to account for a hypothetical hoax both fowler and cummings had witnessed and attested the enca the encasement of artifacts removed with difficulty from the considerable depth of undisturbed caliche the eminent Wake Forest archaeologist, Professor J. Ned Woodall, Woodall, concluded in 1971 that the artifacts could only have been planted during excavations if there had been any planting in recent centuries. Thus, the University of Arizona would have had to continue planting after taking full control of the excavation. A single one of the many competently witnessed discoveries in situ sufficiently disposes of any suspicion of planting while excavating. Thus, <laughs> a hoax would logically have had to be perpetrated in the Middle Ages because of the physical impossibility of, per of perpetrating caliche encasement and deep, hard understanding undisturbed soil in 400 years let alone 20 so they said oh, okay you have 20 years you had to fill all this stuff up yeah you, you had to you know what i'm saying not only create the fake artifact but then you know have it planted in this deep rooted soil you know what i'm saying and, you know undisturbed because you know you can always tell if it's been disturbed you know this is what they do they're like this stuff is found in undisturbed soil that looks like it ain't been disturbed in hundreds of years. And you did all this to prove what? The hoaxer did all this to prove what? <laughs> he he put Paleo-Hebrew, you know, he wrote all these stories about, about Israel the first, Israel the second, Israel the third, all these inscriptions, all these things, you know what I'm saying, to prove what? Because ain't nobody buying it. They're all going to think it's a hoax, right? They're all going to... Say, nah, this belongs. I mean, even the Smithsonian and then was looking at this stuff at first and they said, oh, we, we can't talk about this. The Jews in New York was like, the, the newspapers in the 20s and 30s were saying, Jewish artifacts are found in America, in Arizona. And then, yeah, we found our heritage there. But then they stopped talking about it because then now you're going to have to claim to be Kitsukoholdom 
<laughs> you, you, you're going to have to claim all the mine history and the Almec history and Sylvanus to Texas. You, you got to claim all this history here in America. That means you was the ones also discovered by Columbus, right? If you're the Toltecs, now they got to claim to be the Toltecs. Because all this is Toltec history, all this stuff they're finding. All this Nehemiah, Theodorus, and, and Sylvanus told Texas, this is what's written on these artifacts. Or else we wouldn't be talking about it. This history's coming right out of Arizona, my nigga, in deep-rooted soil. How can it be a hoax? No one's talking about it. Nobody wants to mention it. The museums don't even want to touch it. Who is it a hoax for? Who's benefiting off of this? The Jewish community won't even talk about it. If anything, it'll benefit them. But then they got to claim to be you. They got to claim to be the Toltec, the Aztec. Which means that they, by nature, will be against the United States government for invading them, right? Instead of working with them. Clearly, they're tribed up. <laughs> USA and Israel are tribed up, right? Anything happens to Israel, we're going to do this. Yeah, they've been rocking with Israel on, on paper, right, for a long time. They can't do that if Israel's the tall tag. As much as these people want to talk Holocaust and they can actually claim to be the tall tag, the actual indigenous Americans that were murdered and slain in the millions and, and, and diseased up. These are the righteous, pious ones over here living in paradise, Managi. But they just converted in the ninth century, Managi. What? You just converted in the ninth century, man. You didn't even know Hebrew existed in Europe in the eighth century. All these people admit that they're, you know, fanning go back to Russia or Poland, or, you know, all these other spots that are really swarthy areas. And you're like, so where did y'all, what? If these are swarthy places, where do y'all really come from? Why are you hiding up under all these tents? And now we got y'all backs, y'all squirmy backs to the wall because you see this Hebrew coming out of Arizona. You can't even claim it. You see that Decalogue stone, thousands of years? You can't claim that if you're just now converting. Now you got to say, I'm not a convert. I'm the actual seed of Israel. Ooh, you really want to bear that, bear that crown? <laughs> you want to be that type of blasphemer, that type of false witness? You want to break the code right now, man? I don't think you want to be a code breaker right now, man. It's better to be a spell breaker than a code breaker. Not when it comes to Hawaii's code. So they're in a the crux right now. They say, well, we can't claim these things. So what do they do? Ignore them. Who's talking about them? My naga, we talking about them. No one else. Very. I mean, the fine drop on this, man. <laughs> it's only so much drop you're going to find on this, man. You know what I'm saying? So. Even if it's a few books, we got like three different books. We got the Rodents, uh, the Adventurers, the Rodent Adventurers, or the Adventures of Rhoda, <laughs> something like that with Kalelu's Artifacts. We got this book by Cyclone Covey just called Kalelu's. Uh, we got another one too. Another one, man, that I got, man. So we got like, yeah, three books or so that's actually talking Kalelu. It might be a few more, you know what I mean? So, but nobody's talking about it. Nobody's digging up these books. <laughs> Nobody's, you know, enjoying this flow live in the ether, man. So what you're doing, my nag, I need you to know. It's very special and it makes Hawa smile. Because this information is being brought out by you. You know, that you know, they they did their part. They they documented what they had to and they passed it, you know, within their families. You think he was trying to get rich writing this book? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know, but we're connecting what's being found in the 20s at the same time that you got, what, G.E. Kincaid doing all this uh, Grand Canyon, discovering all these uh, chambers and, you know, all this all this connection right there, all this 
old world connection in, in the Grand Canyon in the 20s and 30s. You got the same thing happening with Kalalus. Then you go into the Worlds Beyond the Pole and uh, August Picard and all this pop off. And this Amadeo Giannini. And it's the same damn time, the 20s and 30s. So they're over there looking for Worlds Beyond the Pole, doing all this nuking the, nuking the firmament, <laughs> looking for Kalalus. Looking in the Grand Canyon, these niggas is popping off in the 20s and 30s, man. They looking deep, right? 30s, 40s, 50s and all, right? So we waking up right on time. Like they had about 60 something years to play with our stuff. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A few things they found in the last 70, 80 years. You know what I'm saying? Still trying to figure it out. Don't know where you coming from. Don't know why we popping off like this. Never saw us coming. They can't see beyond that that thought of spell barrier, right? They can't see beyond the greater light. It's formless. It's shapeless, right? But that doesn't mean out of order. That means that you got to see clearly. Maybe if you could see clearly, it wouldn't be formless. And it wouldn't be shapeless. You know, all praise to why, you know, that we can... Dig. And when I mean dig, man, I mean dig deep, man. Because <laughs> in order for this stuff to be a hoax, they got to talk about physical, physical, the, the physical impossibility of perpetrating Kalish encasement in deep, hard, undisturbed soil that ain't been undisturbed in at least 400 years. How do you fake that? How do you fake undisturbed soil that according... You see how much these people are testing? We're talking Columbia University. We're talking Yale. We're talking all the universities. We're talking all the major museums. And ain't no one talking about it today. No one but you. But they were all digging on it, right? That's something, ain't it? Hey, man, this is where we come to get... <laughs> our flow, you know. This is where we kind of get, you know what I'm saying, the tools, you know what I mean, to build in real time. We're going to leave off on this part right here. About January 1928, the splenetic the demanding attorney, George M.D. Hawley, arrived on the same arrived on the scene from Rochester, New York, Manier, Bent, uh, Sarley, Miss Ostrander, and Cummings all tried to cooperate with him at first, but lost patience and brushed him off when he became to them impossible. At this, he conceived a furious animosity against the artifacts and those who believed in, in them. So he, you know, wasn't feeling them, right? This Hawley, so then he's... He started calling this stuff a hoax, right? All right, so Cummings referred to him as the busybody, but it was Cummings whom Haley or Hawley mainly hoped to impress by systematically documenting Fowler's reservations. A note Hawley penciled on page 55 of his type script reveals much about his undertaking. And here we go. It says, these artifacts were the work of two, and I know their names. In fact, interviewed them in the attitude of the ignoramus after I had con after I had convincing evidence of their work, and in each case I was practically kicked out. Please note on cross B six B two the letter C dot J and the first initial of the one and the other and the letters O-L, the two initials of the other, a Latin teacher, L-O, reversed. <laughs> so he say O-L is just L-O, reverse of a Latin teacher. And he's going to say that it represents this excavator um, named Laura Ostrander, <laughs> the same one that's been trying to show them that this stuff is, you know, not hoaxes. He's saying, oh, man, that's, that's their work, man. And, you know... So he just bare false witness, man. He got no evidence. He's just saying, like, look, man, I know these, these, all this stuff is the work of two people, man. <laughs> and one of them is his lower, lower did it. 
and <laughs> such and such. So he said, Laura Ostrander was not a Latin teacher. The initials on Artifact 6B as CS, not CJ. The inscriber of the artifact signed himself as OL, not O.L. Uh, Bent said he would he would have sued for Libel, L-I-B-E-L, of Miss Ostrander and Dr. Sarley had Hawley been alive when the manuscript came to light. So they're saying that, man, if he was alive, man, we would have sued his ass. <laughs> All right, Cummings may have received the original of the typescript with photos entitled Facts versus Artifacts and Antidotal Disquisition applied to the artifacts excavated near Tucson, Pima County, Arizona during 1925 and you know, 1924 and 1925. It opened with a self-laudatory prefatory letter to Cummings dated Geneva, New York, July 20, 1928. Two typescript copies were found among Hawley's papers, which he had wheeled to the Rochester Public Library. This lets you know how important these artifacts are that even the hater, right, even the one that didn't get along with the group, started saying these are hoaxes, Hawley, he even put it in his will that his documents on him will go to the Rochester Public Library. He didn't say, oh, man, it's a hoax. I ain't messing with y'all. I'm out of here. <laughs> it was so important that he put it in his will, you know, where his documentation would go. The library kept one and gave the other to the Arizona State Museum. This would have been about 1956. But ain't nobody talking about it today. Hawley was careless of facts. He called Laura Ostrander, Leonora Ostrander, gave the distance of the lime kiln as five miles from Tucson, said the first artifact weighed 90 instead of 62 pounds, repeated Blair's error that Sinai was a modern word, etc. Still, the question is whether his conclusions were correct. So these, all these guys with all these educations don't really sound very educated. You know, that's pretty much what I'm getting from. And, you know, I mean, they're just spitballing. You know, they're just guessing. It's all guesswork, man. He decided that the translation of the artifacts Latin had appeared anonymously in the New York Times, December 13th through 25. Uh, 25th, 1925, must have been done by the presumed inscribers of the artifacts because of Harkness and Allen and Greenberg phraseology in the translation, i.e. the translators knew where to go, having derived their inscriptions from the same source. Miss Ostrander and Sarley had, in fact, prepared the translation, but it distinctly differed from the Times, who did the Times translation does not come out in any of the documents, but the speculation that a supposed planter would have volunteered his own translation to the Times sounds no more plausible than speculation that a given translation might naturally fall into the phrasing of classical sentences. He had puzzled through in Latin class. Although translations differ, the original models themselves possess inherent tendencies of their own which often do result in surprisingly similar translations since Suetonius. Furthermore, the same passages from the same select elite of authors, Caesar, Cicero, uh, we got Virgil, Horace, etc., have tended to be abstracted as pedagogical examples for classical Latin usage. The real question is why the bent artifacts cho choice of examples should more closely coincide with two certain textbooks than any than with any others found by those of us who have searched. Hawley himself knew enough Latin to realize, as he said on the same page, that he penciled his claim of having identified the hoaxers, quote unquote, that most of the errors on artifacts seem to be errors of the ear <laughs> rather than the eye we have noted that the hebrew apparitions apparitions also tended to be phonetic so he's saying oh the hebrew is not really correct the latin's not really correct well how are you gonna correct a people <laughs> that are 
popping off a thousand years before you. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, you got the correct version. Like, how, how you going to tell them what the correct version is, man? But that's just the arrogance of it all. To Harley, phonetic errors could only mean imperfect, imperfectly heard diction. If he misattributed the cause of the errors and the identity of the inscribers, he scored some direct hits on the question of coincidence. He extracted 39, sen 39 sentences from the 1881 through 1883 and 1892 editions of Harkness, 14 further sentences from Allen and Greenboro in 1903, and a couple dozen maxims and models from the standard dictionary of facts of 1914 which he said were found on the crosses so all this linguistic managa uh you know expertise right <laughs> going in to hebrew artifacts in arizona that you never heard of that you'll never learn in school but at the same time, they're supposed to be hoaxes. By now, we all see the play. You see the play, man. It's like either call it a hoax or you got to claim it. If we can't claim it, it's a hoax. We can't prove the hoax, but we can just use some, you know, uh, uh, circumstantial claims, you know, of diction and this and this don't sound right. That don't look right. You know what? Those guys did it. <laughs> Do you got evidence of that? No. <laughs> okay, all right. And this is what they going off of again. They spitball. The last part is this for the dismount, man. Here are the pair of here some of his paired sentences look a little less than identical, for example. Uh from Harkness. He got Romulus Septim et Trigenta Reganava Anos. And then he got Israel Septim et Sec, sex, Sexaginta Retnat Anos. So you see Israel, you know what I mean? Like, look, man. Again, can Israel claim this? Not if Israel is confederate with the United States, they can't. Or else Israel's going to have to claim that they are these Toltecs, my knock. <laughs> On the other hand, not only are many pairs identical, a number of pairs and even triplets occur in close proximity and hardness and on a cross respectively as far as far as for instance, the following found in Harkness page 225 to two, two, uh, 255 to 256 and on artifact 5B. All right, you see it, man. Some Latin there. Now, it says, Hawley fairly noted that the two grammars were employing sentences, clauses, and phrases from standard classical authors, and he did not disguise either the consistent use of I or V in place of J or U or the unlocatability, unlocatability, of many phrases. However, a sentence wholly traces to Cicero's equidium sapo. <laughs> uh, you see, you see, appears on Artifact 5A the way it does in the 1883 edition of Harkness. Uh, the 1898 edition corrected parente to patre. There may be a tinge of doubt as to whether both Harkness and the cross were in fact abstracting the sentence of Cicero or what are the equal naturalness of de par parente mio would not occasionally the same error in any age. I mean, they're taking tiny phrases, trying to compare them to different things. <laughs> the two phrases happen, in fact, to be interchangeable as late as the 17th century. One's country was expressly thought of in parental terms. So they, they and the issue that they're really having is that they're trying to compare it all to Europe. You know what I mean? They're trying to compare what they're getting in Latin to Europe, not really understanding that all these languages, you know, you know what I'm saying? This is, look, when you're talking about a more and more war and who you're dealing with here, yeah, they had the drop on all these languages. You know what I'm saying? Spanish, 
Latin. All this is coming out of, you know, that Psalms 83 Confederacy, my nigga. You know what I'm saying? They taught these languages to the, you know, other other folks outside of, you know, these uh, original nations. Can you dig it? You know what I mean? So, so they're comparing it to stuff over there, you know, in arrogance, as if they got some perfect flow. You know what I'm saying? Not understanding that all these things was already here, man. And before they they never even heard about Hebrew, you know what I'm saying? So all this stuff is, you know, popping off from the OG. It says two phrases happen in fact to be interchangeable as late as the seventeenth century. One country was expressly thought in the parental terms. Magistrates cited the fifth commandment as a ground of obedience to them. Just the same, this and Hawley's other examples accumulate into a damaging case which concludes that this hypothetical couple of hoaxers would have had to be recent they would have used the 1883 edition of Harkness the only edition containing all 39 sentences allegedly taken from Harkness while in while it retained its corrected patre error but they would have had used the 1903 edition of Allen and Green Greeno the only edition used in Tucson High School in, in 1914 edition of the Fact di Dictionary for the dictionary did not include Latin phrases until 1912 edition. The 1914 edition was the only one to be found in Tucson. Okay, okay. All right, man. Get to the point, man. <laughs> Time-honored maxims from Horace's and Cicero's ob ova to ob ovio to Virgil's Venet, Summa, you know, all that, all that, appeared on the crosses in alphabetical order. This order, to be sure, was an old, was as old as the Latin alphabet itself. The Diplodocus, all right, back to the dinosaur, here we go. So they found a dinosaur engraved on these swords, man. These, these ain't just crosses, these are swords, man with dragons or dinosaurs on them. Engraved further required a hoaxing date at least as late as 1905 because as Hawley knew, no drawing or reproduction of a diplodocus existed in modern times until 1905. So Hawley proved that the art or so-called proved, quote unquote, that the artifacts have had, had to have been inscribed and buried between 1914 and 1924. A generation subsequent to the construction of the lime kiln, the excavating for which had turned up two of the evidently already buried artifacts in 1884. Fowler and Hawley stirred clear of the Hebrew inscriptions. Say it again. Fowler and Hawley stirred clear of the Hebrew inscriptions, but Hawley assumed that the University of Arizona Library had a book containing the word forms found on the two Hebrew inscribed artifacts. Neither he nor Fowler addressed the further problem of the source of the engraved pictures, including the geometrical field, quote unquote, field design. It is not that these men had to find the sources to prove the copies recent frauds, but that nobody's search, nobody's search in all the years since the discovery of the artifacts had located a precise model for the avenging and heraldic angels, etc., except for finding them consistent with 8th century iconography. The distinctions, the distinguished Texas archaeologist E.B., quote, or, you know, so-called Ted, Sales, S A Y L E S, curator of the Arizona State Museum. All right, so these, these are the curators of the museum. 1943 to 1961 concluded his 1968 account of the of the December 13th, 1925 through March 7th, 1926 newspaper controversy with the statements that the questions had did how did the lead crosses get there? and why and who made them have never been satisfactorily answered. 
So you, before you call it a hoax, before you say, oh, you know, this is fake, you know, <laughs> you got to try to, you know, bring some, you got to have some type of non-biasness to you, right? <laughs> you can't just be biasly trying to prove it's a hoax. You got to have some type of questions being answered, you know, why? Why hoax or, you know, why are they being made? How did they get there? Who made them? You don't even know who made them, but you're calling it a hoax, right? Have never been satisfactorily answered. And this is a quote from the archaeologist E.B. Sales. He said, had, had I known about them when the controversy raged, my sympathy would have been with the star and with and those who work to determine their origin and meaning. So back to the Star Magazine or the Star uh, Tribune, I believe, one of the publications that were actually, you know, trying to discover more about the origin, not just brush them off, you know what I'm saying? Who work to determine their origin and meaning rather than those who set out to condemn them before they could be investigated. Again, before you call it a hoax, investigate, man. Really search out who made them. You know what I'm saying? Really search out how they got there. Why are they there? Same thing, you know, today. Oh, all this must be just to just to prove y'all theory, man. They've been pro they've been proving it since the nineteen twenties. This ain't no new theory. This ain't no psyop, man. The psyop, man. It's what's having you distracted from keeping a code. That's the side. That's the only side up you need to pay attention to. What's distracting you from keeping a code? Ain't nothing more important than you keeping a code. Nothing on the news. Nothing that no politicians talking about. Nothing that's coming out their laboratories. Nothing that could be genetically this and genetically that. Nothing of all these things for you to worry about. Worry, worry, worry. Fear, fear, fear. My noggin, you got to believe in who you are. If you don't believe by now, then just get the hell about our way. Because we vibing up. You ain't never witnessed what happens when these 500 code keepers pop off, my noggin. These 2,000, 3,000, 20,000 one million code keepers pop off my noggin. You ain't never witnessed all these noggins keeping the code and what it does. So all your worries and all your fears and all your warnings, man, they're vanity, man. Sometimes people just want to sound, you know, like they're tuned in, tapped in, but they're confused. They have no answers. They just go from thing to thing, place to place, talking about this, talking about that with nothing to connect any of it. Never investigating. They just call it an investigation. They don't get no answers. They just got a bunch of questions. Well, what if this? And what if that? And what if this? Well, what about this? But they never search it out. They said, well, you know, you know, maybe I'll pick it up later. They never pick it up later. Because they're not truly investigating. They, they just want to poke holes in everything. They just want to poke holes in everything. Well, you know, if the creator does this, they just want to poke holes in the creator. <laughs> They'll never get the answers they're looking for because they're never truly investigating. It's about keeping the commandments, my knife. You don't think that's enough? Then this ain't for you. This ride ain't for you and the wave ain't for you. You go with your questions to your corner and keep asking yourself and chase after your own tail. Anything distracting you from keeping the code, that is your sigh up. That's your distraction. It's the only distraction you need to focus on. Whether or not these are true artifacts or not, my nigga, don't even worry about this. <laughs> not until you get yourself together. Don't don't let this be the, the you know uh, deal breaker or the or the deal sealer for you of whether or not you keep the code. You figure that out, man. You get that together. By the time you come over here, you surf the wave with Drop Nation with the Eat the Squad. Now you're ready to investigate. You're ready to search for Preston John, O 
only because you've already tapped in with her why and you keep the code. So to this archaeologist, E.B. Sales, in the last analysis, which century they belong to is an insufficient question. They should be preserved in some Arizona museum. It ain't about what century they belong to. It's about why you're not preserving these artifacts, why you're not displaying these artifacts. How can you say it's a hoax without investigating? Because you can't back it up, because you can't claim it, or because the truth will set the Naga free. That you are already home. And there ain't no AD and there ain't no BC. You always existed, my knock. They are as much a part of the state's heritage as are the myths and legends that have enriched it as the documents of its historical backgrounds and the records of its archaeological past. We'll pick up, you know, with the University of Arizona phase of excavation, you know, in the next Kalei. Shout out to my code keeping Nagas, man. That's just, you know, add more of that powwow, man. Add more of that, that tribal flow, that energy, the connection that we all miss, that we all appreciate. For every one of my noggers that's keeping the code, we already won, man. Love the natural bylaw. When you realize you are the natural ones, you know, and whatever happens next is is anybody's, you know, uh, speculation. But for us, it's nothing but pure joy. Because if anything compares, you know, to the hell that we've been in without having our unity, without having our Hawa, without seeing clearly, <laughs> ain't nothing compares to being blind, Manaka. So, you know, I'm grateful for whatever happens next. And rocking with my code keepers is all I could ever ask for. I'll praise Hawa for Drop Nation, because we've been patiently waiting. And make sure you're tuning in, man, every Tuesday. Checking in, man. <laughs> We got the shows flowing, the drops flowing. It's all happening. The wild again for all the support. All the great ether packs y'all looking out for. It. If you're still waiting on your ether pack one, we got a brand new shipment coming in. So we got y'all. It's all happening this weekend. Again, the water for your patience and the a hop that you show to want to grow and want to want to have this, you know, information with you. You know, what I'm saying want to have that that flash drive. You know jam-packed with all this great drop and you know this is what hawa has been allowing us to tally up and you know document and pass out to our families and you know have them uh you know spread out the the real documentation you know that proves who we are you know what i'm saying so we're gonna keep the ether packs coming <laughs> ether pack two is dropping this month man probably next week so hello why we're gonna keep it going to ether pack three and four look out for us man we're going to keep compiling the information and making it convenient for the kind, man. The water for surfing the wave and just know you already been here and they're pulling out your artifacts. They're denying them. They're hiding them. Doing everything to hide the fact that you are already home and you're the Naga that they found here in Kalelu. Hey, hala, hawa, shalawa to the tribe.
Wow. Wow. 